Have you ever wondered how graphing calculators work? Or what about online math tools? Personally, I've always been curious about how these things operate, especially with regards to calculus. So, I decided to build my own calculus tool using Java, and this is how I'm doing it. Hello everybody and welcome back to a brand new video. So in this episode of creating calculus tool, we will be doing basic derivatives and antiderivatives using the power rule. So if you don't know what the power rule is, it is a way to take derivatives and antiderivatives easily and it's usually used with terms in polynomials. So just quickly before the video starts, I just want to remind you to subscribe for more Java and programming videos as well as regular tech videos because if I get to 5,000 subscribers by the end of 2021, then I'll be doing a giveaway so be sure to subscribe so you can enter into that. Anyway, let's get started. So here I have my program. If you haven't seen episode 1, uh, I'll leave a link to that. Make sure you go and check that out first so you can understand what we're doing today. But I made a few kind of major changes since last time. And so I'll just be sharing with you uh, what I did and why I did them, uh, as well as we'll be also starting to do calculus today. So the first big thing I did was uh, created uh, doubles. So uh, technically I didn't create them, but I, I just changed it. It used to be integers. So the coefficients, exponents, all used to be integers. And now I made it a double. The reason I made it a double is because now that we're taking antiderivatives, sometimes we will be doing division and the division may result in decimal. If we leave it as an integer, it's just going to truncate the decimal and that will be really inaccurate. So we need to make sure it's a double. So the, I did a lot of changes throughout the program, just mostly just changing the types of variables and changing things like this so that it uh, worked properly with doubles. But it's not anything major. It's, it was just a mistake on my part. I should have thought about that beforehand. So that was the first thing I did. I uh, changed uh, everything so that it works with doubles now. So now when I create a new string, I can still have like things like this, which are negative three as an integer. But when I uh, actually create it in my constructor, it's going to convert it to a double. And that said, I've also added some more methods that will help to format the doubles because sometimes I personally don't like when if you're printing out a polynomial, if it says something like, I'll give you an example, it says like 2.0x to the 2.0 power minus 3.0x plus 5.34, something like that. Uh, I don't really like when it has these decimals where they're unnecessary when it's a 0. .0. So I created some methods so that this would just be formatted as 2x squared and minus 3x. But if there is a decimal, it, it maintains the decimal. So yeah, we created these methods last time. I made some changes. So after we populate all our different variables uh, in our constructor, so actually I should open up the constructor. Once we populate everything, we call this thing called update terms. And the purpose of this is to convert any double values into integers just as in the string form. So so even though our coefficients are realistic with all doubles and our exponents are all doubles, we want our terms to have integers when necessary. Just get rid of the point zero if that's the case or leave the decimal if that's the case. So that's what this update terms method does. And I've added that to both of the constructors. And I also added a method called round. This uh, rounds a decimal value into uh, usually I use three places, three decimal places. I didn't actually write this program. I just got it from somewhere else. But I didn't want to use it because when we print out our polynomials, we don't want some things like pi, for example, to be like a bunch of decimals. We want to keep it neat and organized. So I round up to the third decimal place and I use that in my methods. So those are the things we did with doubles. Now we're going to actually do the real calculus. So I've created four different methods here. I've created a derivative, antiderivative, solve at, and integral. And so let's first go through the derivative. So what this does is it first creates a string of terms called deriv terms. Then it loops through our current terms and it finds all the constants. And if there is a constant at that value, then it continues past it because that means the derivative is zero. And then if the exponent is one, we have to do another special case where we just take the coefficient. If neither of those special cases are true, then we just do the default, which is power rule. If you don't know the power rule, it's basically take the exponent value, multiply it by the coefficient, and then subtract one from the exponent. So for example, if I had six x squared, this would become six times two, which is 12, and then x to the two minus one, which is one, so 12x. And then you can also see that since we don't want this to say 12x to the first power, we also have a special case here where it says if exponents.get is two, then we have a special case there. And so once we populate all our derivative terms by doing the power rule on each term, then we return a new polynomial that is created with these uh, derivative terms, since we have a constructor that takes an, an array list of strings. So I did test this uh, derivative method already, and I'll show you it again with the tester method, but I'm not going to do that quite yet because I want to show you the antiderivative first and then we'll test both of those together. So this is the antiderivative method. 
This is pretty similar. This is using uh, maybe some people call it the reverse power rule. So what this does is say again, if I had six x squared, this in this case, what I do is I add one to the exponent, so it becomes six x cubed, and then I divide by the new exponent, so six x cubed, and then divide six by three. So again, we first have a six x cubed, and then we take that three and say six divided by three, which we get two. So we get two x cubed as the antiderivative of six x squared. So that's how you do a reverse power rule to get antiderivatives. And so again, we create a new array list of strings. We loop through our current terms. We find if it's zero, then we uh, continue because we don't want to include zeros. We check if it's a constant, and if it is, then we have to add the coefficient plus an x because antiderivatives work differently than derivatives. Derivatives remove the x's, and uh, antiderivatives add more x's. Uh, and if the exponent is negative one, then this is a special case because if the exponent is negative one, then this is actually the antiderivative is natural log. So if we had uh, x to the negative one or one which is equal to one over x, then the antiderivative of that would be natural log x. And since natural log x would not really work with our program as it is, I just return a new polynomial zero. And actually thinking about it, I should probably print out that uh, this is a natural log, so that's why it's not working. So I just made a message so it prints out one of the terms is one over x or involve one over x and uh, remove it and try again. So, and then it returns a new polynomial with uh, zero as the terms. And then if none of these special cases are true, then we, again, we just do the reverse power rule like what I just explained. And then of course we return our new polynomial using this uh, anti-terms or anti-derivative terms array list that we created in the beginning. So those are the two uh, derivative and anti-derivative methods. And now I can show you the tester for these. So let me uncomment this. And so I have two polynomials. I have one is 5x minus x squared plus x to the fifth. We're doing the antiderivative and the derivative. And then we're doing another one, which is a much more messier one. It has a lot of decimals. We're, again, we're doing the antiderivative and then the derivative. So let's go ahead and run this, and we'll see what it does. So the first one we have is 5x minus x squared plus x to the fifth. So our antiderivative will be adding one exponent, which is correct, and then dividing, so that's correct. And then minus x squared, so adding 1 and dividing by 3, that's correct, and then adding 1 exponent and dividing by 6, that's correct. Our derivative is 5 minus 2x plus 5x to the fourth, that's also correct. So these are both correct. Now let's check this one. This is going to be a bit more harder for me to check just because of the decimals. It's not as easy to calculate, but it does look to be correct, just uh, kind of approximately. We're adding 1, so this would be around 3.5, and then 31 divided by 3.5, it'll make sense to be around 8, and 100x, we know that's 50x squared. And this is what I was saying, when we have a decimal like this, 100.0000, that's why we have our round and our formatting methods, so that this comes out as 50x squared and not 50.0000. And the same thing here, you can see we rounded our decimals from four decimals to three decimals. And then our, our derivative proves to be right. This one is gone because it's a zero as the exponent. We subtract one from this and we multiply by the previous one, so that makes sense. And then 100x, the derivative of that is just 100. So now we have two more methods, the solve at and the integral. These are much more intuitive, I think, than the other ones. So the solve at just solves a polynomial at a certain x value, a double x value. So we loop through the terms and we find the coefficients. And if necessary, we multiply the uh, term by the coefficient and we raise the term to the proper power. And then we add that term value to the result. Then we again round it and return it. And our integral method is making use of our this.antiderivative method. So we first take the antiderivative, then we find the value of the antiderivative at the lower and upper limits, and then we subtract upper limit minus lower limit. If you don't know what this is, this is from the fundamental theorem of calculus, which tells us that the integral from a to b of a function f of x is equal to the antiderivative of f of x solved at b minus the antiderivative of f of x solved at a. And so now I'll go ahead and test these two methods. I'm only doing one polynomial here, and the reason for that is our integral method actually uses the solve at method. So if the integral method is working properly, that pretty much implies that the solve at is working properly. And plus I have tested this before and I know it does work properly. So this is a pretty messy polynomial with uh, lots of doubles and decimals. So if I go ahead and run this, you can see that my answer is negative 0.133 as our integral from 3.5 to 4.7654. And now I'm gonna show a picture of uh, the same problem that I did on my TI-84 calculator. I put in the exact same function, and I put the exact same limits in, and you can see I got a very similar answer. I got negative 0.132, and the reason for the slight difference is because we rounded here, 
in the solve at method, we rounded to three exponents, and so that made it 0.33 instead of 0.32. I'm kind of thinking of changing that to maybe 5 for next time or 4, but I'm not sure. It seems to be fine for now. I'll change it if necessary in another video. But yeah, that's all for this video. Next video, I think we're going to focus on some reorganization uh, for the polynomial class especially. And after that, I'm going to try to do the power rule and the quotient rule, which are more complicated ways to take derivatives. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, again, make sure to subscribe because I'll be doing a giveaway at 5,000 subscribers. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.